Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today I've got a practice question for you. This is related to the neuromuscular and nervous system. So on test day, you can expect to see somewhere around 39 to 40, 48 questions. So really a generous number of questions related to the neuromuscular and nervous system. So definitely one of the bigger systems you'll want to spend some time with. So today we've got a practice question for you, but before we get to that, just a quick thank you. Thank you for what you do. I, I know that as you're going through the study process, it's very difficult. There's a lot of time and hours put into this. I just want to say thanks. I know it's a big sacrifice on your part, and I appreciate the efforts you're putting into this as you are coming through the exam, getting to the other side. You'll be a clinician right alongside of me. So I just appreciate what you do as you prepare for this major exam. Bas biggest exam of your life, I think, uh, you and I both appreciate the weight of that. And so I want to make sure that you know that I appreciate what you do. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into our practice question here for today. As per our usual, I will read through the question, give you a moment to respond, and then we'll talk about it together. A patient with multiple sclerosis experiences discrete attacks of symptoms followed by periods of alleviation. Which of the following disease courses is most likely present? A patient with multiple sclerosis experiences discrete attacks of symptoms followed by periods of alleviation. Which of the following disease courses is most likely present? Option one, clinically isolated syndrome. Two, primary progressive. Three, secondary progressive. And four, relapsing remitting disease. So number one, clinically isolated syndrome, two, primary progressive, three, secondary progressive, and four, relapsing remitting disease. Well, the correct answer here is that option four, the relapsing remitting disease, as you consider what the characteristics are of the typical disease modifiers or the disease courses or the phenotypes that are experienced by a patient with multiple sclerosis, you'll see that the most common one is the relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. This occurs in, I think, approximately 85% of patients. This is the one where you get these, these periods of exacerbation or attacks of symptoms followed by periods of alleviation. Now, typically, relapsing remitting disease or relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis will convert into what's called secondary progressive MS. So secondary progressive MS, this is where you have the, the relapsing and remitting periods. However, each relapse uh, results in a worsening or a progression or ir what uh, O'Sullivan calls the irreversible worsening with each attack. And so therefore, typically a patient will follow this course. Their first attack will be called a clinically isolated syndrome. So this is usually what, what's referred to as the first episode. They don't know the, the physicians, they, they don't know what course will be. And so they call it this clinically isolated syndrome. It's like the first step on the MS pathway. Eventually, in most people, it does convert into what's called relapsing remitting disease. And that's what we talked about here, where you have the exacerbation followed by the alleviation. That eventually converts very often into what's called secondary progressive. That's where you have the irreversible worsening with each attack. And then finally, the, I guess, just on the, on the list of potential conditions, this is, again, in, in less than 15% of cases, this would be what's called primary progressive, where you just have a steady, it's like a linear increase in symptoms over time with no periods of alleviation, or if they are, they're extremely minor. So you'd see this primary or nearly continuous worsening over time without any distinct episode. And so that's the real key here. When you're considering the phenotypes for multiple sclerosis, you'll need to know these four basic phenotypes. Uh, the first one or first on the list would be clinically isolated syndrome. That's like the first episode. The Once it converts into the most common course, that'll be relapsing remitting. That often turns into secondary progressive. And then finally, the last, almost an outlier, not an outlier, but like 15% of patients, we're talking the primary progressive or the linear increase over time. So there you go. That's the primary course of multiple sclerosis. Now, the interesting thing about MS is that it does have quite a significant variety of symptoms that can appear. Uh, a lot of the patients I've seen with MS, they'll have visual problems, they have balance problems. Um, you'll see a, quite a variety of patterns. A lot of these folks experience urinary incontinence, a lot of ataxia, spasticity, fatigue. In fact, fatigue is one of the biggest, uh, biggest symptoms these patients will face 
that they just have, uh, like one patient I had, she always referred to it as, uh, she had a doctor who told her this, said that at the start of every day, you have $1 to spend in energy. And so you don't want to spend 99 cents of it before lunchtime. You need to make sure to pace yourself so that you don't overburden or overtax yourself over the course of an entire day. The other th key thing, and, and I, I've talked about this before in previous episodes, but with MS, the other key consideration is the heat intolerance that these folks have, meaning that they respond much better, they get better nerve conduction, they, they just have a better response to activity if it's performed in a cooler environment. So therefore, if you have an, an increase in temperature, whether it be in the room or the patient, uh, they typically have a, a adverse response to that. They just, they'll get significant fatigue, a worsening of symptoms. You'll find that it's best to treat these folks in either a cooler environment or possibly putting a cooling vest on them. And ideally in the morning time or when they have a little bit more energy, you'll have a better intervention strategy if you're able to incorporate cooler environments in the morning in order to manage the fatigue that these folks will typically experience. So there you go. There again, quite a battery of symptoms. It is considered an upper motor neuron disorder. So you'd have a lot of spasticity, hypertonicity. And just remember, I tell this to all my classes. So we, we run via my VIP class. We have our premium courses as well as our crash course. I, I try to mention this every time, but just keep in mind that, that when we talk about an upper motor neuron disorder, we talk about it in terms of spasticity and hypertonicity. But remember that leads to weakness. And in my mind, it's always a little bit of a, uh, almost counterintuitive. You say, okay, well, they have too much tone in their muscle. How could they be weak? Well, the weakness shows up in forms of coordination, meaning that if you're trying to lift something off the table, like lifting a, a pile of books off the table or putting dishes into the cabinet, you don't have good control of the motor units, which will appear as weakness, meaning you can't generate sufficient force to, to create the activity. You'll have difficulty with ambulation. You'll fatigue very quickly. So again, just keep in mind that an upper motor neuron disorder with hypertonicity, they will also be weak because they can't mount a good for they can't have they don't have good force production and so therefore it would be classified as weakness. So uh, just keep that in mind that uh, some for some reason and it was in my mind too when we think of upper motor neuron disorders with hypertonicity, we often forget that that is a form of weakness. So. Again, lots of symptoms, quite a battery of symptoms that could occur with MS. But again, you'll see quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of uh, fatigue, heat intolerance, visual deficits, urinary incontinence, uh, the upper motor neuron disorders. One of the key tests you could do is what's called Lermitz sign. It's spelled L-H-E-R-M-I-T-T-E, Lermitz or Lermitz sign. Uh, that's where you go into deep cervical flexion and causes, it causes an electric-like sensation down the spine. That's an indicator of multiple sclerosis. So there you go. There's your MS question for today. Just a reminder, we are doing some free sessions for our VIP class. So if you want to take part in any of our VIP sessions, you'll want to be sure to head over to ptfinalexam.com. You'll be able to participate there. Uh, the VIP class, just again, a little plug there. I, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's where we do, do a small group session, small group sessions in our VIP program. It's, I, I personally take people through that. We go through each of the body systems on the test. We do it again in a small group setting. And that's maybe the biggest unique factor that you'll find if you attend some of the other courses that are out there. It's usually just pure pandemonium. So <laughs> I think you'll enjoy that it's a, it's a place where you can get your question answered. You can have one-on-one -on -one phone calls with me. Really, the best it's the best bang for your buck out there. We've got six practice exams that comes with it, written material. So really, you don't need a lot of outside resources. We provide a full video library, assignments each week, the practice questions, plus you get nine months of access to it. So really, all told, it's an extremely robust system in order to help you prepare for the exam. So if you've had a failed attempt on the exam or you know you need just a little bit extra help to get over the test, this is definitely one of those, those exams you just want to get done and under your belt and on your way again. So you'll want to ensure passing by participating in a course like ours, the, like the VIP course. So anyway, take good care of yourselves out there. Happy studying. I hope that you will catch us all in the next episode. We'll go through more practice questions as we go through the FSBPT content outline. In the meantime, though, happy studying, stay safe, and I'll catch you later. Thanks, everyone.